He knows and he understands and he cares about your situation. I'm going to say that again. Jesus knows and understands and he cares about your situation. You don't need to tell God how big your storm is. You need to tell your storm how big your God is. God has this under control. Hey, it's Pastor Dudley of Lift Up Jesus. Thank you so much for joining us today on our broadcast. We are getting ready to start a brand new series called The Sands of Time. I'm going to be sharing some history lessons. I don't know about you, but I enjoy history. And if we fail to remember, then we're doomed to repeat it oftentimes. We wanna learn the good and the bad, but then we wanna go to the scriptures. And we wanna see what God's word and God's will for us today as we move towards the future. And so I hope today you've got your Bible, hope you've got some notes, hope you'll invite some friends and join us today on our broadcast. But thank you for listening and for being here. I'm excited to preach for you this new series called The Sands of Time. Today, I want you to take your Bibles and turn to Mark chapter 4. That's Mark chapter 4. We'll be at the end of that chapter in a few moments. Our first history lesson in the series, The Sands of Time, evolves around a famous painter from the 1600s. Many of the most famous artists around the world are known by a single name. You have Leonardo, you have Michelangelo, you have Picasso, you have Caravaggio, you have Raphael. And if you're an artist, and let's say you died three, 400 years ago, and yet people still know you today by your name, then I suppose you made it as a successful artist. Today's history lesson centers around another famous artist painter known by just his first name. The name Rembrandt. Rembrandt was born in the year 1606. That's 414 years ago. And without question, he's the most famous painter to have ever come out of the Netherlands. About uh, seven months ago, about half a year ago, my wife and I were blessed to do a cruise down the Rhine River over in Europe. There were five couples that were friends of ours who talked us into joining them on this cruise. And we really enjoyed it. Down one stretch of the river, uh, there were 80 castles on both sides of the river. It, it really was an enjoyable time. But the cruise embarked from the city called Amsterdam. And so we flew into Amsterdam a, a couple of days early. And one night, uh, we had, the first night, we had dinner with a couple that were originally from our church. His name is Wigel, and when he was like 20, 21, he was in this church, Shepherd Church, and he went off to Bible college, and then he went to the Netherlands, and he, he started a church, and today it's like the largest church in all of the Netherlands. And so we had dinner together the first night, we just again had an enjoyable evening. The second night, because Amsterdam, although a beautiful city, has some very seedy sections, and to be honest, the entire city smelled of marijuana because there's a marijuana shop like on every corner. I said to my wife, I said, honey, let's walk out, let's get out of the city center, let's, let's, let's just go like exploring. And so we walked for 25, 30 minutes, and we came to a, a plaza, a small plaza, and discovered that this plaza was called Rembrandt Plaza. And they had a statue of Rembrandt that was made in the year 1852. That statue is almost 170 years old. Rembrandt lived and had an art studio next to this plaza back in the 1600s. That night, it was kind of raining off and on, so my wife and I, we ducked in under an awning of a cafe, and we drank some coffee, and I ordered a big plate of hot, fresh 
cut french fries and we put salt all over there and had ketchup and drank coffee and we just looked out over that plaza that night uh, the rembrandt plaza it was a delightful evening just the two of us and it was at that time we're sitting underneath that awning looking at this plaza that we decided to google rembrandt because we didn't know a lot about him and we started to read his story this brilliant eccentric painter during the golden age of the netherlands many of his 300 paintings we discovered were biblical characters or biblical scenes and one of his most famous paintings of all his paintings was a painting called the christ and the sea some people call it the storm and the sea but christ and the sea it was painted in the year 1633 it's a large painting absolutely beautiful four feet wide it is five foot two inches tall it's the only seascape that he painted it's considered a masterpiece primarily because of the contrast between the darkness and the light you can see several disciples up front frantically trying to fix the mast and the sail jesus of course is in the back of the boat he's been sleeping and the disciples have just awoken him they woke him up and you can tell by jesus's face that he's not too worried about the storm there's one man just to his left it's difficult to see unless you look at it up close that one of his disciples has his hands folded in prayer and he's he's literally begging jesus to save them on top rembrandt painted one of the disciples you can see by his face that he is totally frightened you can see the fear on his face one of the disciples is down lower he is literally throwing up uh, obviously he is seasick he has had enough one of the disciples is just sitting there resigned to the fact that they're all going to perish and if you go back to the photo it is truly a magnificent piece of art some 400 years ago now this dramatic scene comes from our text today uh, at the end of mark chapter 4 and what i want to do today is i just want to read this text and then i'm going to tell you seven things and i'm going to we're going to go through them as quickly as i can but let's read this text then we'll go back through it mark chapter 4 beginning with verse 35 that day when evening came he said to his disciples let us go over to the other side leaving the crowd behind they took him along just as he was in the boat there were also other boats with him verse 37 a serious squall came up and the waves broke over the boat so that it was nearly swamped jesus was in the stern and again rembrandt painted all this in that painting jesus was in the stern sleeping on a cushion the disciples woke him and said to him teacher don't you care if we drown he got up he rebuked the wind he said to the waves quiet be still then the wind died down and the bible says it was completely calm and he said to his disciples why are you so afraid do you still have no faith the bible says in verse 41 that they were terrified and they asked each other who is this that even the wind and the waves obey him oh what a much needed text for our world today before i go on i just want to ask you are there any of you who are frightened today are any of you scared today are any of you living in fear today are there any of you who feel as though you're about to die as though you're about to go under and you look around and jesus is nowhere to be found well i pray that today is the day where you move from a life of fear to having a life of faith that's my prayer for you today i want you to picture yourself this is all this is important you can use your imagination i want you to picture yourself there that day in mark chapter 4. imagine that you are one of the 12. you've been there all day with jesus watching him perform miracles listening to his teaching dealing with the great crowds and all of a sudden the sun starts to set everyone is tired including jesus himself 
And what we read in verse 35, I want to go back to this again. That day when evening came, he, Jesus, said to his disciples, and remember, you're one of them, let's go over to the other side of the lake. That's the Sea of Galilee. And in verse 36, the Bible says they actually get in the boat and they head out across that lake. My question is if you had been there, and be honest, you were there when Jesus was performing the miracles, you're one of the 12, you're listening to him teach, it's at the end of the day and you're tired and Jesus is tired and he says, hey, let's go in the boat and and get away from the crowd and go to the other side. How many of you would say, all right, I'm in, let's go. I mean, after all, it's Jesus. Are you kidding me? He wants me to get in the boat and go across the lake with him? I'm, I'm, I'm the first one in the boat, if he asks. How many of you, be honest, would you have gotten in that boat that day? Well, we all would have gotten in the boat. Well, here's my first point of seven points. Number one, following Jesus does not exempt you from storms. Following Jesus does not exempt you from storms. This text is a perfect example that you can be in the center of God's will and still be subject to storms. They were doing exactly what he asked them to do and found themselves in a life-threatening situation. You know, we're always trying to figure out why. Why are we suffering? Why are we going through these difficult times? Why do we have to stay sheltered in our homes? How long is this going to last? Will I lose my job? And if I lose my job, how am I going to pay all my bills? This storm is so severe. Why is this happening? Well, some storms are decreed, and they're for disciplinary reasons, like Jonah when he ran from God. Uh, That was a storm. Some storms are a test, like with the story of Job, where God allowed the storm just to test Job. Some storms are a result of being persecuted because you're living for Jesus. There's a result of being persecuted. That's a storm. Just ask Daniel or go ask Stephen. And some storms are just because we live in a fallen world. They just happen. There are many reasons. There are are many types of storms for many reasons. And you might not ever know the answer of why. But what you need to note, number two, write this down, is that storms are a part of life. Storms are a part of everyone's life. Peter tells us in 1 Peter 4, 12, do not be surprised at the painful trial you are suffering as though something strange were happening to you. Storms aren't strange. Storms are norm. I I want you to say, whoever you're sitting there with, just say, storms are norm. Say that, storms are norm. A storm doesn't mean that God doesn't love you anymore. A storm doesn't mean that God is angry with you. A storm doesn't mean that God is toying with you. Sometimes he may be disciplining you. He might be teaching you. He might be growing you. He might be testing you. And at times, storms just happen. The Bible says in Matthew 5, verse 45, that the sun rises on both the evil and the good and that the rain falls on the righteous and the unrighteous. Sometimes storms just happen. What's important for you to hang your hat on is point number three, and that is that Jesus will be with you in the storm. Oh yeah, Jesus will be with you in the storm. The Bible said in our text that a furious squall, that, that's, like a, that's like a seismic category five storm came up. And the Bible says the waves were literally breaking over the boat. And this boat, it's not an ocean liner. It's not, it's not like Pastor Tim's yacht. It, it, it's just a small wooden boat. I mean, if you just stood up in it, you might fall over. And these storms are break, the waves are breaking over this boat. And the Bible says that the winds and the waves, as they were breaking over the sides of the boat, the Bible says that it was nearly swamped. That means that the entire boat was full of water. It was about to sink. They were all about to die. And verse 38 to me is funny. I mean, the first line is funny. That Jesus was in the stern, sleeping on a cushion. I didn't know, I didn't know Jesus had a cushion. The Bible says he was asleep on the cushion. 
Have you ever met someone who can sleep anywhere at any time? Don't people like that make you mad? Oh, yes, they do. Jesus was sound asleep while the disciples were all terrified. They truly believed that they were about to perish in the depths of that sea. So the disciples, in verse 38, they, they wake Jesus up because he's back there sleeping. And they wake him up and they said, asked him this question, don't you care? Don't you care if we drown? Don't you care if we drown? You see, they mistook Jesus' silence as him being unconcerned. We've all been there, haven't we? You might be there right now. You're in the middle of a storm, you're in the middle of a crisis, and it seems like God is off somewhere taking a nap, like you can almost hear God snoring, like he could care less what's going on in your life. And because you think or actually believe that he's being unresponsive to your dire situation, you draw the false conclusion that God doesn't care about you. Nothing could be further from the truth. Jesus is in the boat with you. He's with you in the storm. He's with you in the crisis. What he's hoping and wishing is that what you have seen and experienced him do in the past would somehow provide a stronger faith for your future. If you know anything about the Bible, if you know anything about Jesus, you know that Jesus will never leave you and that Jesus will never forsake you. He will be with you through the storm. And you need to take this to the bank. And when I say take this to the bank, I mean take this to the memory bank, number four. Eventually, Jesus will calm the storm. Can somebody say amen? Eventually, Jesus will calm that storm. Verse 39 says that he got up and he rebuked the wind. And we know a lot about the wind here. He rebuked the wind and he rebuked the waves. He said, quiet, be still. And the Bible says that the wind died down and that the waves became completely calm. You see, there's one thing that I am certain about all storms, and that is that storms don't last forever. I want you to turn to whoever you're sitting next to and you tell them, storms don't last forever. You say that. Say it one more time. Say it one more time. Storms don't last forever. I want you to turn to whoever you're sitting next to and say these words. You tell them. Joy comes in the morning. Say that. Joy comes in the morning. Some of you are acting as though storms last forever. Storms don't last forever. Jesus calmed the storm that had frightened the disciples with just three little words. Quiet, be still, and calm the storm. Imagine if Jesus spoke a whole sentence or a whole paragraph. Imagine how powerful that would be. You see, God does not go by our timetable. He has his own timetable. He's going to calm your storms when he chooses to calm your storm. He has his own timetable, and his timetable is perfect. He knows and he understands and he cares about your situation. I'm going to say that again. Jesus knows and understands and he cares about your situation. You don't need to tell God how big your storm is. You need to tell your storm how big your God is. God has this under control. Point number five. I'm going to tell you something that everyone already knows but that no one enjoys. Point number five, write this down. Faith is developed in the storm. Faith is not developed in the calm. You see, we want faith to be developed in smooth waters. Faith is not developed in smooth waters. Faith is developed in rough waters. One summer, during a violent, violent thunderstorm, there was a mother who was tucking her small boy into bed. 
And she was just about ready to turn off that light switch when he asked the little boy with the tremor in his voice, he said, Mommy, will you sleep in my bed tonight? Will you sleep in my bed tonight? Mother gave him a reassuring hug and said, I can't do that, dear. I have to sleep with Daddy tonight. And after a long silence, it was broken by that little voice. The boy said, that big sissy. Oh, listen, storms frighten us, correct? Storms, they worry us, correct? Jesus, in our text in verse 39, he stands up and he rebukes the wind and the waves, and, and the wind and the waves, it's completely calm. And then he turns to his disciples in verse 40, and he says to them, why are you so afraid? Do you still have no faith? Pay attention to that. Do you still have no faith? In Luke's, Luke 8 account, he asks, where is your faith? And what I see in this text, Jesus first, he rebukes, watch this, he rebukes the wind and the waves, and then he has to rebuke his disciples because they're exercising no faith. The amazing thing that most of these men were experienced fishermen. They had grown up on the lake. They had been in many severe storms, but this must have been the mother of all storms because they were all afraid and they all thought they were going to drown. And Jesus asked them this question. Now stay with me. Anytime Jesus asks a question, it's not because he doesn't know the answer. He already knows the answer to this question. But he asked a question in a true rabbinic tradition. For he asked a question in attempt to get them to see and to understand a much deeper truth. Do you still have no faith? In other words, he's saying, you guys have seen me perform miracle after miracle after miracle after miracle. Isn't there anything in your memory bank of all the miracles I've ever performed that would lead you to believe that we're not going to be okay. You see, the real question he was asking is when did you lose your confidence in Jesus? When did you lose your confidence in Jesus? Can I be extremely, extremely transparent with you for just a, a minute or two? Some of you listening right now have lost your confidence with Jesus during this COVID-19 season. Some of you are so afraid of dying that you're afraid to live. Some of us are acting as though this problem is way too big for God to solve. Oh, I hope you were blessed today. I don't know about you, but there's something about history that we learn as we move towards the future. And one thing I know is that God's Word is eternal. I wanna thank you for tuning in today. I pray if you were blessed by today's message that you will contact us. You can just call the number on the screen. We would love to have you come along and partner with us so that we can continue this broadcast and broadcast all around the world. I know that you know this, but we think that we have the best name of any program on television, Lift Up Jesus, and that's why we exist, to simply lift up the name and the person of Jesus. We wanna encourage you to join us prayerfully, financially, verbally, however you can to support us so that we can reach the four corners of this globe. I wanna thank you, please know that I love you, we are praying for you. Feel free to write to us and let us know if you've been blessed by this message today. And I want you to know that whatever you're doing or wherever you're going, don't forget to always lift up Jesus. So in 2008, uh, my family and I, we were living in the foothills of Silmar, which is, you know, all of you guys probably know, is a um, area that's really prone to fires. And probably about two or three uh, in the morning, I remember just waking up to uh, police sirens and they were talking over the loudspeaker like you need, like, you need to leave right now. 
In the morning the next day, it was pretty early, um, I was in their living room by myself watching the news. And um, they were covering, you know, the fire. You know, they cut to the, the girl who was, um, you know, on the field doing the reporting. And I knew immediately that we had lost her home because she was standing right in front of what used to be our house. Just kind of that reality of the situation, like really um, just set in that like, oh man, like what are we gonna do? As hard as like that moment was and when things really started to like sink in, like uh, God was just with us right away. And God just used so many people um, at Shepherd to, to just come around us through that time. And a lot of times I look back on um, that experience, the way that God loved my family so well through through Shepherd Church and through the things that His people have done here and the things that the church is able to, to do to support people um, like our family, like my family. Since I graduated at college, God brought me back to to shepherd. One of my favorite things that I've been able to do is be a D group leader and it's just been such an honor and privilege to be able to give back to the place that has given me so much. Kind of in this time God has continued to, to guide my journey and um, showed me really where He wants me to go on the field and um, in just about a month I will be leaving to go serve overseas for a year. Places like Shepherd are able to exist because people are faithful in in their obedience of tithing and and giving back to the Lord what He has asked us to give. To me, it's so like crazy and hard for me to wrap my mind around that just such a small act of obedience can have such a huge, huge impact. And because of people's faithful obedience to God, um, my life has been changed and now not only has my life been changed but I have the opportunity to go and share God's love with the world. Research proves that it's the regular hearing and teaching of the Word of God that takes our Christian life to a new level. That's why we invite you to meet Dudley Rutherford every week on this station for another powerful message straight from the Bible. You can also visit liftofjesus.com to sign up for our monthly email devotional, discover Pastor Dudley's books and other resources, and see our national TV and radio schedule. And don't hesitate to reach out on the phone or online. Pastor Dudley has a passion and vision to reach more people with a message of hope. And if you'd like to partner with us to touch the world, we'd love to hear from you. Your financial gift will do so much to help us impact the nations for Christ. And if you're ever in the Southern California area, we invite you to visit us at Shepherd Church here in Los Angeles. It's an amazing experience you'll never forget. Until next time, remember to always lift up Jesus. Jesus.